we look at see how things change with the scan rate and concentration and so forth. And so here are some comparison voltammograms. Glassy carbon on the left, tetrahedral amorphous carbon, the 30 SEC and one over here on the right. And these are data from scan rates of 100 millivolts per second to 500. So in both cases, the waveforms uh, evolve, very well defined. Importantly, the kinetics are pretty fast here. So even with the increase in scan rate, system is almost nerdsty and still very little change in the peak splitting for glassy carbon. Same kind of behavior is seen over here for the TAC. And again, we can calculate or simulate to determine the rate constants. Pretty fast system kinetically on both of these materials. You can investigate how things change with the sweep rate to learn about the nature of the mass transport. This again is a ruthenium system. These are the voltammograms, the reduction of ruthenium 3 to 2 and the oxidation back to ruthenium 3. Curves are shown for increasing scan rate and they're plotted over here. So all nice linear behavior with the square root of the scan rate. So the nature of the mass transport for this system is semi-infinite linear diffusion with no adsorption. So you can do these kinds of experiments for lots of redox systems to determine diffusion or adsorption processes on the surface. Uh, we can look at things like, um, what did we look at here? This is scan rate. Oh, this is for the periferocyanide system. Again, comparing glassy carbon on the left, TAC over here on the right. You can see for glassy carbon that's well conditioned, this system is almost nerdsed in on that surface as the peak splitting is about 60 millivolts. You can see a much larger peak splitting over here for the TAC material. So the kinetics of this system are quite a bit slower on a TAC material than they are on glassy carbon. And the opposite is true for the ruthenium system. So uh, one point I want to make is that if you want to investigate different carbons, then you have to be very careful about the choice of the molecules you use to test with because some molecules are more sensitive to certain parameters than others, okay? The electrochemists always like to use the very fair cyanide system. Actually, I'm getting tired of using it. It's so old, but it's, it's a good one that we use, but you have to remember that it's sensitive. The kinetics of this system are sensitive to different factors on different parameters on different carbon electrodes. It's very important to remember this. Uh, you, you want to know if it's analytically useful, so how do things change with the concentration? These are concentrations at one scan rate as we go from 0.1 millimolar up to 1 millimolar, well-defined voltammograms, nice linear increase in the peak current with the concentration here. So this is very, very important uh, to know that your system is analytically useful. And something else that's very useful for this kind of measurement, and when you want to use voltammetry to study the kinetics, the, the peak splitting changes with the rate of the electron transfer, but ohmic effects cause the peak splitting to change too. So you have to make sure your voltammetric curves are not affected by ohmic resistance. One easy way to do that is to measure the increase in concentration, so increase in current. And if you study this, that the peak position here is independent of the concentration. So if there's ohmic effects and you increase the concentration, the peak splitting will shift because of IR drop. And so we don't have that. So this is a very important experiment that we have to do in order to verify that our kinetic measurements are, are valid. Um, just to show you a couple of examples here where all the electrodes are compared, all the same area, the ruthenium system over here, glassy carbon in the red, diamond in the blue, Tack the black, all virtually identical in terms of the response. And over here on the right is the ferry ferrocyanide system again. And if you look, the peak splitting for the black one, the tack is a little bit larger than what it is for the other electrodes, reflects the more sluggish electron transfer kinetics for this system. And the final thing I'll show you is just when we calculate these rate constants, we usually do it by digital simulation. A so called Digisim is the software that we use. So when we get an experimental curve, like this black one here for the ferry ferrocyanide couple, we input parameters, diffusion coefficient, rate constant, and so forth, and simulate the curve shape to determine the rate constant. So you can see here the simulation fits are generally pretty good for these voltammetric curves on the TAC materials. This is the simulation fit for the ferry ferrocyanide couple on the TAC electrode. And over here on the right, is the ruthenium system. So you get a little bit of deviation over here uh, in the mass transport limited region here, but generally speaking, the fits of these are, are quite good. And again, rate constants are 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2 for this system. 
rate constants for the ruthenium system are 10 to the minus 1 centimeters per second. One last thing to show you is we can tell whether or not the material is behaving like a diamond electrode or like a more graphitic electrode is by adsorption studies. So most molecules, not all, but most have very weak adsorption on a diamond surface. Uh, the surface chemistry is important, but the bigger difference is there's no extended pi electron system on a diamond surface like there is on a graphitic surface. And so this extended pi system is very important for influencing pi-pi interactions, dipole-dipole uh, interactions with the surface. We don't have that on diamonds. So we do these experiments on a TAC electrode. And I show you this over here on the right. So if we look at the CV on the right, this is a molecule methylene blue. It's a very, very strong adsorber onto glassy carbon. On the right over here is the voltammogram, the dashed curve, is when it's in solution. OK, so there's the oxidation wave, and there's the reduction wave. This is the structure. So we can pull one electron out of that ring, and we can give the electron back, so a nice reversible system. You can see here's the peak current, the peak current. If we measure this peak current, it's about 0.14 microamps. And if we calculate what that peak current should be for a diffusion control process, it's virtually the same number, 0.15. If you take that electrode that was exposed to the methylene blue, take it out, wash it, put it in a clean electrolyte, you get back this dash curve that follows the black line. So virtually no signal detected at all. No adsorption on this surface. If you do the same experiment on glassy carbon, you can see the waveform changes quite considerably. This is sharp symmetric oxidation reduction waves. These are very characteristic of adsorbed processes that are redox active. You can see here if we, calc if we measure this peak current here, it's 7 microamps. Theoretically, it should be 0.15 microamps for a diffusion controlled system. So we have lots of these molecules adsorbing onto the surface. So this kind of an experiment with molecules that adsorb give you a very, very good idea about the microstructure of your material at the surface. So even though these TAC films have some sp2 bonded character to them, the bonding in there is not graphitic and it doesn't promote any strong molecular interactions with molecules like this methylene blue here. You can do some work in ionic liquids, which we've started doing here recently, trying to understand kinetics in these systems. And one of the important points about working in ionic liquid is removing the water. So it's very, very difficult to do that. And so we've been working on different procedures. And this is one of these TAC electrodes shown in uh, a butyl methyl imidazolium uh, ionic liquid with, with tetrafluoroborate as the anion here. These are very, very viscous. You probably know about them. They're about 100 times more viscous than water. So mass transport in the ionic liquids is a lot slower. Electron transfer in the liquid is a lot slower. But they're not volatile. And there's no solvent. It's a cation and an anion, so there's no solvent. So a electron transfer processes and double layer structures in ionic liquids are very, very different from what they are in aqueous electrolytes. So if you want to study these, you have to work on getting the water out. And so I'll show you here two curves. This is by two different purification processes that we're using. Uh, one we so-called a traditional one, which is just vacuum drying. And the sweeping one is when we actually heat it and we purge, purge with high purity argon to more quickly displace the water. The black curve is what you get for a TAC electrode. You can see the window now is roughly 6 volts, 6 to 7 volts. This is very nice for capacitor kinds of applications. This peak right here is the water oxidation peak. You can see that in a traditional method, we have water that's present. And we can measure the water several hundred parts per million are still left. This particular one has less than 10 parts per million in there. So if you want to investigate these, you have to get rid of the water. So I just show you that just to indicate you know, these tack materials have some utility, not only in aqueous systems, but other things, organic systems, ionic liquids. OK, very quickly for the last part of the talk, let me show you one example of how these electrodes function electroanalytically. And so I'll start with this uh, particular curve right here. So you know when you work with carbon and want to detect things, very often we do it amperometrically. And we will usually will often detect analytes at positive potential. So we'll carry out an oxidation to detect the analyte to the concentration of the analyte. Well, one of the problems you worry about when you do this is with carbons, how the background signal changes with time. Because 
Many of the analytes we're interested in require positive potentials for the detection. These are potentials where the surface of the electrode can undergo changes. And you don't want that for an analytical application. So what you tend to see is a background signal that will drift and often increase with time. It'll start off nice and low when you first repair the electrode, but over the course of time of use, it increases. One of the things that you find with diamond, and I'll show you with TAC in just a moment, these background signals are low and stable and they don't have the same problem. The microstructure doesn't change when you apply the positive potentials for the detection. The surface chemistry can change a little, but it changes and it's constant. Adsorption isn't a problem, so you tend to get much, much lower and more stable background signals with time. So the sp2 carbon electrodes here can undergo oxidation and microstructural damage that causes this problem. Stable background currents are nice because they lead to better signal to background and signal to noise ratios and allow you to detect lower concentrations. So I'll show you some data from a flow injection analysis system. So many of you are familiar with this, I think. There's a flow cell, an injection valve, uh, a pump right here. So we'll pump a carrier solution through the flow cell continuously and then periodically inject analytes. When they travel across the electrode, we can get a response and detect them. We use a cross flow uh, geometry in our flow cell. There's two pieces, a top Teflon piece and a bottom Teflon piece. It's a little dark, but the tetrahedral amorphous carbon electrode is sitting there. There's a small gasket on top that defines the volume of the flow channel. You flow in, across, and out. And as the analytes come into contact with the electrode, you get a signal. So you, it's very low collection efficiency, maybe 0.5%. So all the molecule, 100 molecules going through there, maybe we only detect five. But still, it's very, very useful for detecting analytes. And so that's the design of the cell, which we've been using for a lot of years now. Here's a few pieces of data to show you how these TAC electrodes actually function. So on the left over here are data for a boron dope diamond electrode, a typical one that we would use. And on the right are one of our conducting nitrogen films here. These are the background currents here, plotted as a function of time at different potentials. So we're making the detection potential more positive from 100 to 900 millivolts. So if you look at the data for the diamond electrode, you can see as you increase the potential, the current increases, that's what we would expect. You can see also that the current is decays and pretty much stabilizes reasonably fast, usually less than about 500 seconds. This is very characteristic of diamond. If you do this kind of experiment on a piece of glassy carbon at these potentials, it can take 20, 30 minutes for it to stabilize. So the stabilization time for these is, are typically very, very fast. Well, that's diamond. If you look over here on the tack, same area, same everything. Look how much faster the response time is on these materials. They're very amazing. Within 100 seconds to 200 seconds, we're already at a stable background. Now we're at a point where we can start making the measurements. And you can see here that the current increases with the potential like we would expect. If we make some plots of what that background current is at the end of the period as a function of the potential, these are shown here. The red dots are for the TAC electrode. The black dots are for the diamond. This line is not regression or anything, just to, to draw your attention to the trend. You can see that at all the potentials, particularly at the high potentials, even a diamond electrode, these TAC materials have background currents that are two times, three times lower per, for the same area. If you look at the noise, so at the end of that detection period, this is the average background current. The noise is the standard deviation about the background current how the signal is fluctuating with time. You can see that for the TAC electrode, the noise is basically constant, about one nanoamp for all those potentials, about five times lower than what we get with diamond. So not doing anything to the electrode, automatically we have a five time improvement in the signal to noise ratio, which means our detection limits can at least go down by a factor of five. So those are very, very nice properties of the material. If we make some hydrodynamic voltammetric measurements, so these are done, these are half of a CV. We make injections of the analyte at different potentials and plot the average current. The red curve here is for a TAC electrode, the black curve here is for a diamond electrode, and the molecule that we're oxidizing in this example is, is norepinephrine, a neurotransmitter, a two electron, two proton oxidation process. So you can see that the half wave potentials are vir virtually identical for both of the electrodes. It means the activity of both of them is the same. 
The mass transport, the limiting current here is different, and that's basically because the height of the channel was different in one measurement than the other, so that's not so important. What is important is this half wave potential, which is virtually the same, so same level of activity for both of those electrodes. 